Kia ora, I'm Simon Hampton. Welcome in to Kiwis Abroad on Sky Sport, where we take an in-depth look at the Kiwi athletes plying their trade overseas. Well, we often hear of athletes giving back after their careers are finished, but Kiwi tennis star Marcus Daniel is aiming to assist athletes giving back throughout their careers. He's launched charity High Impact Athletes, and he joins me now from Austria to discuss. But first, Marcus, how are things going over there? Yeah, things are good. Uh, it's been a little tough with pretty strict lockdowns here uh, for quite a while. So, you know, uh, all the shops closed and obviously all the restaurants and cafes closed. But that's meant that I've been able to keep my head down and, and put some really good training in in the off season for me at the moment. Um, and the good thing is I'm in the town where my doubles partner lives. So we've, we've for the first time in my career, um, I've been able to do the off season with my doubles partner. And that's been very fruitful so far. So in that sense, I can't complain. Yeah, I was, I was just going to ask about training through COVID and, you know, with, with um, travel being a bit tougher. But that's sort of benefited you in a way in, in that you've been with your doubles partner and been able to train and, and build up that, that relationship there. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was really brutal through the year. Uh, you know, we were sort of going from bubble to bubble, um, just hotel room to tennis courts. And, you know, if you went outside those bounds, then you were disqualified from tournaments. So we had to be really careful with what we were doing. And it was incredibly dull. Um, you know, it, we couldn't look forward to, to crowds at the, at the events or anything. So it was, um, you know, just head down playing tennis. Uh, but then end of the season, you know, we're in the western part of Austria here in a town called Dornburn and it's right at the foot of the mountains. So we've been getting up into the snow and, you know, doing some beautiful hikes. Uh, so yeah, we've been making the most of it. I mean, my wife and I would love to be back in New Zealand at the moment, but it is a little tricky getting back. And uh, yeah, we decided to, to do the time here. Yeah, so training wise, are you, do you train indoors and do you have to sort of, are there, are there any extra precautions you have to take even, even with your training in Austria? Yeah, yeah, no, there's, um, we're getting tested every week uh, and only the people who have been tested and have negative results are allowed into the training facility. And it's uh, only, I think, three codes. There's uh, tennis players, some ice hockey players come in to use the gym and some handball players. So it's, it's pretty strict here. Uh, I think Austria has actually done a really good job around COVID. Um, you know, they've had a bunch of free testing uh, for all the residents of this area, which we've made use of. Um, and we're, we're being as cautious as we can, you know, we're sticking to a very, very tight group of friends, wearing all the masks and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, over the last four months, I've had upwards of 35, 40 tests. So, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've had my fair share. Um, I, one of the things you've been keeping busy with, though, is uh, a new charity, High Impact Athletes, um, which sounds really exciting and, and something you're, you're getting off the ground. Can you tell me a bit more about that and, and, and what the uh, mission of that um, charity is? Yeah, sure. This is, um, I'm super excited about this. Uh, it's an idea I had during the worst of COVID, and I think in sort of March, April, I had the idea. Uh, and the idea is to use the influence and the, the social power of athletes to do as much good as possible in the world. And when I say as much good as possible, I'm talking about uh, using the ideals of a movement called effective altruism, which is the idea of getting the most out of each dollar donated. Um, using those ideas, using the research that's already been done in the effective altruism world, uh, to send money to the most effective evidence-based charities in the world, uh, focusing on two areas right now, extreme poverty and environmental impact. Um, so that mostly means sending money uh, to organizations that are doing phenomenal work in countries like, or in areas like Sub-Saharan Africa um, and environmental, on the environmental side of things, uh, it's organizations like the Clean Air Task Force or uh, the Good Food Institute, you know, really disruptive um, organizations that for each dollar can just do a huge amount of good. So 
yeah, the idea is to get as many people on board as possible and hopefully leverage athletes' followings and teams' followings to bring, you know, the, the wider support network in, involved and just channel as many dollars as possible to these places that do amazing things with them. And so you guys sort of um, research these charities and, and provide the background info and help the athletes decide um, which charities are the best um, to make their dollar more effective. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so essentially... HIA, High Impact Athletes, is an educational tool and portal at the moment. I don't for a second ascribe, you know, expert researcher status to myself, but there are some incredibly smart, dedicated people within the effective altruism movement who have spent decades trying to evaluate charities and figure out which ones are the most effective and which ones do the most good. So I'm relying on their research. All of this research is absolutely transparent. Like I can, I can point any athlete or any fan or any supporter in general who's interested to these research re reports where, you know, you can spend many hours just reading into what one charity does. Uh, but I'm relying on that research and I'm just trying to do outreach and bring as many people in as possible and spread the idea as wide as possible that it really does matter, you know, up to a hundred or a thousand times, it matters where you send your money. Some charities are just so much more effective than others. And it's a, it's a little known truth really in the, in the philanthropy world. And I think it, it's, um, it could be hugely beneficial if a wider audience knew that. And has there been uh, much buy-in from athletes um, into this? And what's the interest been like from them? Yeah, it's been absolutely incredible so far. Uh, I, I'm at the very earliest stages of outreach and I'm starting in the, in the sphere that I know, which is tennis. Uh, but so far, almost every athlete I've talked to has been interested. Uh, there are very few have said, uh, you know, it's just not for me. Uh, I already have some, some of the biggest names in tennis on board. Um, this is, I'm hopefully going to be able to promote that and put that out uh, sort of at the end of this week or, or next week. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm actually... It's, it's extremely gratifying for me to see something that was, you know, an idea in my head six months ago, uh, sort of being validated by these huge names. Um, but yeah, can't complain at all. I don't know what. So what, what inspired you, I guess, to, to start this in the first place? Well, this is, a, this is an idea that I've been personally involved with for five or six years now. Um, I think it was uh, 2015 where... I sort of first got to the stage with my own career where I was no longer terrified of ending the year in the red. Um, you know, I'd, I'd amassed a small amount of savings in my bank account and I had always felt a little guilty about how selfish a tennis career is. You know, now that I'm playing doubles, it's a little more team oriented, but um, when you're playing singles, you're really just focusing on yourself the whole time. And uh, so I was thinking, okay, now, you know, now I feel like I have a living out of this. How can I give back? And I just started researching online, came across an organization called 80,000 Hours, and it just blew my mind. The idea that I could use this career to, to do a huge amount of good in the world. So the two things that I took away from that website were one, that you can earn to give. You know, you can, if you earn a lot of money, then you have a lot of money to give away to the people who need it most. And the second thing was, uh, if you build a big enough platform, you can be a very successful advocate. So, you know, for me, that meant, okay, if I do really well in tennis, then not only do I feel great about myself, you know, for personal achievements, I can also affect hundreds, thousands of people and, you know, non-human animals in a positive way and have an effective platform to, to sort of spread these amazing ideas. So, yeah, that was, that was the first introduction for me. Since then, I've, I've donated a, an average of, between five to 10% of my annual income to these effective organizations per year. Um, and it's, it's been a, a beautiful shift in my life. Um, it's given me a much bigger purpose. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lifelong thing for me and, and I just hope I can, I can bring as many other people into it as possible. I can't imagine this is sort of too hard to sell to athletes, but I imagine when you've got that sort of personal anecdote and, and, and personal background of how that's shifted your life a little bit, that does help when you're, when you're talking to athletes and bringing them on board? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it's a little scary thinking about a percentage pledge at the start of a year, especially for athletes like tennis players who 
don't really have any idea how the year's going to go. You know, if you get injured as a tennis player, then you're making minus because you've still got all your expenses, but you're not earning any money, um, at least for the, for, for the ones who don't have big sponsors. Um, so a percentage pledge is pretty scary, but on the other hand, it's, it's, it is just a beautiful commitment. And it means that, you know, if I go out and make quarterfinals of, of a Grand Slam or, you know, I win a tour event, then I can know by chasing a very little yellow ball around that I've, you know, helped so many other people than myself. And that's just pretty special and, and pretty amazing when you put it in real terms like that. And are you just keeping it to athletes now or, or could you see this expanding down the line to, um, you know, to other celebrities and other influential figures? I really do hope it expands. I mean, the way that I ultimately see it working the best is that by having athletes on board, they can bring their as many as many people within their followings on board as possible. Uh, so, you know, the initial target audience is athletes and the brand is high impact athletes. But I, I really hope that isn't exclu exclusionary for, um, you know, fans of sport or just people who want to do something good in the world. And the other thing I'd say is that, you know, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not worried at all about whether the money comes through HIA or, you know, whether I have any recognition for the, for the money that gets sent to these charities. I just think the thing that really matters is that these organizations that can do incredible things with a small amount of money, they need those funds. So get it there however you want, uh, just as long as it gets there, that's, that's the bottom line and, and I'll be happy. Hey, well, best of luck getting this off the ground. It's a really cool initiative and um, certainly wish you all the best with that. Also wish you all the best um, with, with tennis moving forward. Obviously, you're going into a big year next year with the uh, rescheduled Olympics in 2021. How are things going with your tennis? Are you happy with how, how you've been tracking? I am. It's, uh, it's been a funny year, 2020, uh, not just because of COVID. We, uh, my partner and I, we had a, a great start. We made the finals of the, the ASB Classic in Auckland. Uh, unfortunately, he got injured in the semis, so we were a bit compromised for the final. And that carried over to the Australian Open, so we were sort of um, just inevitably out of that early. Uh, and then I got injured after the Australian Open, and my February was out with a, a torn MCL. And then COVID hit. So, you know, we really had uh, one healthy tournament or half a healthy tournament from the start of the year until the end of August for the US Open. And it's always hard to, to sort of get back into gear after a long breakout. Um, it took us, I'd say, until the end of September to, to really get the engine going again. And then for the last little bit of the season, we played really well, had some good results, beat some of the best teams in the world. And now with this off season together in Austria, I'm hoping that we can keep that momentum and, and take it on into 2021 because we do have a, a huge opportunity in the first few months of 2021 to really jump our rankings. Uh, we don't have any points to defend. And uh, yeah, I think we're, we're feeling pretty sharp. So yeah, trying to make a big bang at the Australian Open. Yeah, we touched on um, the, the bubbles earlier and just travelling around during COVID and going from bubble to bubble. Have there been any sort of horror stories of trying to get around and um, the logistical nightmares that, that have come from uh, trying to travel the world um, during a major pandemic? Yeah, look, it's, it's not fun. I mean, you know, there are stories left and right of being denied entry to flights to get to the European Union and just having to, like, you know, take five flights instead of one or... You know, uh, I had a really hard time getting into the States, trying to get to the US Open. I thought for about four hours that I was getting deported back to New Zealand. And uh, my wife had been sent away. She, she wasn't allowed to be with me during that time. So I thought we were going to get split. And then who knows what would happen next. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not fun traveling during these times. The one sort of light in the tunnel is that a lot of the flights are extremely empty. Um, so that, you know, makes you feel a little safer. Uh, on the other hand, when the flights are full and I've been on some full ones, you're just anxious as hell. You know, it's, it's really hard to, to try and take the right precautions if you've got two people on either side of you. Um, so yeah, it, it hasn't been the funnest year on tour at all. Uh, and I think all of us are really hanging out for some normalcy next year. And hopefully with these vaccines coming in, um, we'll get a bit of that, but you know, I'm I'm not holding my breath. I think the first half of next year is is going to be.
pretty tough as well. Well, well, you mentioned the Australian Open. So you're you're in Austria now. You're coming back to America um, shortly. And then, and then when do you head down under and do you have to quarantine in Australia before the Australian Open? Yeah, so uh, the Australian Open have, have been in very, very lengthy talks with the Australian government and things aren't still finalised. So uh, everything's subject to change. At the moment, the best information we've got is uh, we're going to come into quarantine, I think, in uh, mid-January. Uh, everyone's going to have to do two weeks, unless you're coming from New Zealand, actually. If you're flying from New Zealand, then you don't have to quarantine. Uh, but we've got two weeks of quarantine where um, we're allowed to be out of the room at the site, the, the tennis courts, for five hours. So we have um, a five-hour window each day where we can sort of go out and try and get all our training done, all our treatment done. But uh, 19 hours of the day are in our hotel rooms which, um, you know, I've, I've gone through the New Zealand quarantine process, which was a lot tougher than that. So I think for me, it's, it's going to be okay. But I know a lot of the guys are, are really freaking out about, um, you know, trying to fit all their training into a, into a five-hour window and that sort of thing. But the reality is it's, it's incredibly tough to put on events at the moment, especially in a country like Australia that has really basically got rid of COVID. And they don't want, you know, a thousand foreigners coming in and bringing it with them. So completely understand it. And I think once we're through the quarantine, it's sort of life is normal. And then the Australian Open will be the Australian Open. They always do an amazing job of, of making players feel welcome. So two weeks of, of tough. And then I think it's going to be at least, uh, you know, perhaps not the same experience as normal because I think the fans are limited. But, um, you know, it'll be nice to play in front of crowds again. Is it hard to set goals um, for a year like 2021 when this, the playing field is a little bit unknown, when, when we have you know, talk of vaccines, but we're not quite sure how they're going to be rolled out? Yes, and, and we're not quite sure how the pandemic's going to go in 2021. So is it sort of a bit challenging to, to set goals for next year? Yeah, it's, it's, the uncertainty has been really hard to deal with, to be honest. Um, you know, we, we don't have a calendar for next year yet. Uh, we don't have any of the dates for the Australian Open finalised yet. And, you know, this is where we're pretty close to 2021. So everyone's sort of holding their breath and just thinking, you know, when do I need to be where? And, uh, you know, when you don't have a calendar to, to look into and, and try and make a schedule, it's, it's pretty hard to, to stay inspired in, in the training. You know, like you don't have a, a goal to aim for or at least nothing concrete. Um, so I'm, I'm really hoping that the ATP comes out with something in the next week or so. But, you know, that's sort of been the case for the last month or more. Um, and I guess the, the thing that everyone can fall back on is that everyone's in the same position. You know, no, no one knows what's going on. And I guess it's just about who deals with that the best. Um, and yeah, a, a little uh, heading to the States uh, for a couple of weeks up to Christmas with my wife's family. That's going to be a nice little bit of R&R. Try and um, try and stay as fit as I can during that period. You know, it, uh, it's not going to be easy to find courts or, or players to practice with where we're where we're going. But um, yeah, try and sort of refresh the mind and and be able to come into 2021 with with a, at least a little bit of vivacity is the plan. Yeah, I mean, but when you're touching on you know training's been going well in Austria and you've been been with your doubles partner there, you must be sort of confident going into the Australian Open that you can um, have quite a strong showing. Yes, it has been great work thus far. Now the, the challenge for me is going to be holding on to that through these weeks up to Christmas um, and, you know, w without access to, to good hitting partners and, and that sort of thing, that can be tough. I mean, tennis is such a, it's such a field game that, you know, if you, if you don't play at a high level for a while, it, it goes pretty quickly. Um, but then again, I do think, you know, we're, gonna, we're aiming to reconnect as soon as possible in 2021, you know, as, as early as we can in January. Wherever that is, you know, we might be able to, say, go for a couple of training weeks in Dubai um, because I know the Australian Open is going to charter flights from three places and I think Dubai is one of them. So, you know, maybe meet up and try and get a good little block in there before we head to the quarantine at Australian Open. Um, we know that, that we have a, a better opportunity, an opportunity than a lot of other teams uh, in having practice together now. So we're going to try and hold on to it as much as we can. And, and just finally, is the Olympics next year? Um, obviously, that's been rescheduled to 2021. Is that on your horizon and, and something you're, you're um, aiming to be part of? Absolutely. This, is, this has been a, 
uh, one of my biggest goals since Rio. Um, we actually we had a, a real heartbreaker of a loss in the in the first rounds in Rio. We we had a couple of match points and and lost to the Canadians. They were they were one of the seeded teams. Um, and then you know we knew that if we won that match, we would have had a pretty good shot at at a a medal match. At least that was the way we were thinking. You know who who can who can tell? But so that one hit us pretty hard and. Um, straight away we were saying okay you know this is this is something we need to improve on so really really looking forward to tokyo uh at the moment it's it's looking pretty good that we get in uh this michael venus that i'd play with uh his ranking's great he's i think still around 13 or 15 in the world um and you know i, I know that both of us are really pumped for that and uh yeah i i especially coming from New Zealand, um, the Olympics are just a huge deal and getting a medal there would be something I, I'd just carry with me for the rest of my life. Totally, that'd, yeah, that'd be um, tremendous. What is the process for qualifying for that then? What, what, what are the, the criteria you need to meet? Yeah, it's, it's a little different in tennis. Basically, it's a, it's a tournament and you need to have the combined ranking in doubles to get in. Um, each country is limited to two teams, which means that, you know, the, the likes of Spain or France or the States who have a lot of highly ranked players can't just crowd the field out. Um, so at the moment, uh, I think with our combined ranking, we're looking pretty good. Things can change between now and uh, I think early June is the cutoff for tennis. Uh, you know, we only find out a, about a month before uh, the Olympics if we're going or not. Um, but yeah, like uh, Mike's playing great. He's got a good partner. Uh, my partner and I are playing some really good ball and I think that we have what it takes to, to make it. Fingers crossed, mate. Thanks very much um, for coming on Kiwis Abroad. Really appreciate your time. Um, best of luck with your tennis in 2021 and also best of luck getting high impact athletes off the ground and uh, yeah, all the best with uh, making that a successful venture. Thank you very much, man. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for having me on and um, I feel like I always forget to say this to people. So uh, if you're interested in what we're doing with high impact athletes, please do follow us on all the, all the socials. Uh, I'm pretty rubbish at, at all the social stuff. So I'm, I'm trying to find someone who's help, who's going to help me out with that. But yeah, appreciate all the support we can get. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for having me. All right, Marcus Daniel, thanks very much for your time and best of luck uh, for a big 2021. And how good would an Olympic medal be in the tennis? Well, Sky Sport is, of course, the home of tennis. And when the Australian Open rolls around next month, you'll be able to catch all of the action right here on Sky. Well, that wraps up today's episode of Kiwis Abroad. Thanks very much for tuning in. I'll be back on Wednesday night with another episode on Sky Sport Select. Until then, take care, stay healthy.